Okay, uh, so it's 8.30, so let's go ahead and get started, everybody. All right, good morning for the, uh, I guess, the second final time. So, you know, uh, I'll see some of you probably next week if you want to tune in for the final exam. Uh, but good morning for, you know, the, the last lecture that we'll have. Okay. Uh, and so the today we're going to be doing our review session, kind of just like we, we promised. Um, and looking at the poll um, this morning, I saw the top three, top, the top three topics that, um, that you want me to cover is uh, first one is control volumes for mass and momentum. Um, so that's kind of like midterm two stuff. The next is external flow. So that was, you know, this the very recent stuff. And then the last one is fluid static. So we'll, we'll definitely get through the first two today. Uh, and so we're going to cover, we're going to review kind of the theory behind them and then do um, a problem. And so for, um, so for control volumes, I thought, I thought we kind of revisit the second midterm and kind of go over some of the problems for that. Uh, for external flow, uh, we can cover, um, external flows are interesting just because a lot of it is theory based, but we'll, we'll review 3A on the, on the last homework just because that's, that's kind of what I, what I mostly expect you guys to, to do for the exam. Uh, and then fluid statics probably we'll just, we'll just talk about some of the theory and, and the equations. Okay? okay, and so just as a reminder before we begin, our final exam is going to be next Wednesday, uh, December 16th, so actually one week from today. Um, and it's going to start at 9 a.m. So um, it's going to be a 24-hour exam. So you're going to have 24 hours to, to do it. So it's going to be due uh, 9 a.m. on Thursday, December 17th. Okay. And then just like uh, just like I've done for the midterms, um, you know, I'll I'll open up our Zoom call for our lectures at 9 a.m. on Wednesday, the 16th. And so typically, you know, our final exams are two hours. So uh, and so I'll I'll be on the call. Uh, on, on this Zoom link, so you can you can just use the lecture link again uh, between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. next Wednesday, December 16th. So if you if you you know if you're starting the exam then and you have kind of a question right away, you know that you'll you you know that you'll have my undivided attention during that time to uh, to ask a question. So I'll get back to you right away. Um, so I'll be available you know throughout the entire exam period, the 24 hours. It's just that I might not get back to you as soon as you know um, two minutes because it's a uh, because I, I, there's there's other stuff I, I usually do throughout the day, like eat and sleep and um, shower and, and stuff like that. So, um, but you know, during that 24 hour period, I'll, I'll try to get back to you as, as soon as I can if I'm not you know asleep or, or doing something else. Okay, but during those uh, during those two hours between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., you know, you'll have my undivided attention. Okay. okay. Um, and so one other thing that I want to talk about before we begin today, um, which is you know not the most comfortable thing to talk about is uh, academic dishonesty. So, um, so there, there's just as a, as a whole, you know, as kind of probably as an entire university, like we've, we've been seeing, you know, a, a big rise in, in these kinds of cases. Um, and so in this class, actually, you know, I've caught, you know, several, several students doing that. Um, and they're, and they're really, you know, the university and the department and basically everyone up above me is like really pushing to say, you know, we have to kind of crack down on these things. So, um, <clears throat> You know, the, the primary one, you know, and I'll be totally honest with you guys, the, the, the primary one that we've been looking at a lot is, is Chegg. So what we've been seeing is that, you know, students have been posting the exam questions on Chegg and then getting solutions on there. Um, and so, you know, with especially with the format for the exam that we have in this class, the 24 hour exam, it, it kind of leaves a big window for, for those things to happen. So um, so I'm, I'm just, you know, just letting you guys know now that, you know, if, if you do do that, you know, and if we do catch it, you know, it's, it's the punishments are going to be really severe just because it's, you know, just because it's, it's an exam and it's, it's a really big, big thing. So, you know, I've, 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 I've basically had to fail with students that, that we've caught, you know, from, from using Chag during, during the exam. So, um, and so because of that, you know, probably this will probably be the last time that I do 24 hour exams. And so this, this issue was kind of brought up earlier in the semester, but I didn't want to kind of change the format on you guys kind of midway through the semester. So that's why I've kind of chosen to kept to keep the 24 hour exams all throughout, but probably starting next semester, you'll, you'll probably see a lot less, um, a lot less of these, of these formats just because of, you know, the, the potential that it, it has. So, um, so, you know, I'm just, I'm just letting you guys know just to, you know, be totally open with you guys and, you know, just uh, please, just please don't, just please don't do it. You know, I'm, I, I, I try, I usually, I always try to I try my best. If you're, if you're confused on an exam question, I try, if you ask me, you know, I, I try to give you, you know, as many hints as I can. So, you know, try to, so please use me as a resource and, you know, please don't use outside help because, you know, for me, you know, I, I can help you as much, you know, and that's, that's not, there's never going to be anything bad about that. But if you use something outside, then, you know, you kind of open yourself up to the possibility of, uh, um, 
you know, um, of, of doing stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So there's a comment in the chat to the 24 hours are, are helpful. Yeah. Cause, uh, cause I know you guys are, you guys have a lot of going on and you know, there's, it's, it's tough too, cause you know, there's the added technical element of scanning and uploading the, your answers too. So I know. So that's, that's another reason why I kept the 24 hour exam because it is, it is really helpful. Um, but you know, um, that's just kind of the reality of, of, of the situation. But at least for, for this exam, you know, I, I didn't want to change anything just because, you know, I, I pretty much promised you from the beginning of the class that we'd always have 24 hour exams. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to keep that up. I'm going to keep that until the very end. But, you know, just just kind of, you know, letting you guys know what's kind of happening behind the curtain. OK. Uh, OK. Uh, so are there any questions on that um, or anything about the exam format that I can answer before we uh, we begin? Um, today I won't have office hours, but uh, but if you do want to speak with me, you can uh, you can send me an email and we can set up a, a session on on Zoom. Yeah, so my normal office hours are going to be uh, tomorrow at four o'clock. Yeah. Oh, uh, next week office hours. So next week I, I don't plan to have regular office hours, but you know if if you do want to meet and you want to talk and 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 go over some stuff, just shoot me an email or shoot me a message on Discord, and you know I'd be happy to meet because next week I, I am pretty free. Um, Although next week I'll be taking care of a lot of like research stuff, so that's that's why I'm not having normal office hours. But if you do if you do want to meet and talk about something before the exam, just shoot me an email, and you know I'd I'd be happy to set something up. Yeah. Um, I would prefer probably probably if you want to set up a an office hours, you can you can just send me a direct message on on Discord. That's probably the easiest thing. Yeah. Okay. All right, so there's no more questions. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the first topic we're going to go over in the review today is um, control volume problems, uh, specifically mass and momentum. Okay. And you know, and I, and I want to let you guys know that for the control volume problems, I specifically just mentioned mass momentum. So I know we kind of did a two-part thing with with control volume problems, where the second half we did angular momentum and energy. Um, I feel like we 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 did enough of that, you know, for the second midterm. So for the final exam, you don't have to worry about angular momentum and energy. Um, you just have to worry about just mass and momentum. So that's that's kind of the reason why I, I had it like that. Okay. Okay. And so. Um, Let's start with with a, a review of just Reynolds transport theorem. So for all of our control volume problems, our, our kind of our driving force or our driving equation was Reynolds transport theorem or RTT. Okay. And so our formula for Reynolds transport theorem is the following, right? right. And so on the left-hand side of the equation, we had this uh, big derivative right here. So um, d d cis dt, right? Next, we have uh, this term right here. And then we had the inflow outflow term, which is this guy right here. Okay. Okay. So let's define a, a lot of these variables here. All right. So first of all, let's uh, let's define what each of these terms represent. And so remember this uh, this first time derivative here. This is our production or generation term. And so what that term describes is how our um, quantity of interest, um, you know, is, is either produced or consumed, okay, or generated. Okay. Right. And so the second term that we have here with the partial derivative with respect to time, this is our accumulation term, right? So most of the time we're going to assume this term is zero, this is the second one here, because we assume steady, right? Okay. 
Um, and so that's, that's basically kind of the only kind of types of problems that we, we, uh, we went over. Okay. And so the other, uh, this last term right here, probably is the one that we interact the most with. This is our inflow and outflow term. And so what that last term represents is, you know, how our quantity B of either flows into and out of our control. Line. Okay. Right. So remember, uh, um, you know, when we were talking about Reynolds transport theorem, I, I think we had a really good analogy um, for um, between our bank balance. Right. And so the analogy for that was uh, for this last term right here, this represents uh, deposits and withdrawals. Uh, the second term right here, this is our um, balance. Okay. Because uh, accumulation is kind of like the same thing as your accumulation of, of wealth. Okay. And then on the left hand side, you can kind of think of it as almost like the, the spontaneous generation or production of money. And so kind of the analogy that we drew for that is this is kind of like the interest that you gain on your account. Okay, and then uh, let's define what our B is, because that's probably the, the next most important thing here. And to remember, big B right here, this is our um, ex um, extensive property. Okay. Okay. And then little b right here, this is our intensive property. And so the, uh, the way that we're, we apply Reynolds transport is we, we apply this to certain conservation laws in fluid mechanics. So we're going to apply this to conservation of mass and conservation momentum. And the way that we do that is we set our B variables equal to those properties. Right? Right. And so for this, uh, for this particular, um, you know, for this particular review session, our B, our big B variables will either be mass, which is what we'll quote first, or momentum. And the way that we obtain little b from big B is we say that little b is equal to big B divided by m, okay? Right. So remember, you can always think of little b as just kind of like your, your extensive property per unit mass. And so we just, all we have to do is just divide by mass at, at that point, okay? All right, so the, so the challenge with the applying Reynolds transport, you know, the, the terms on the right-hand side here are, are more or less, um, you know, the way that we apply them is kind of the same with, with a little bit of a wrinkle for momentum. But kind of the, the thing that's unique about each of the conservation laws is how we define this production or uh, generation term. Okay? And so each conservation law, um, which in this case, we're only gonna do two, um, has a unique expression for the production and generation term, you know, that we, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to kind of uh, plug in before we, uh, we start applying this for problems, okay? Okay, uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. Okay. So the first thing we're we're gonna do let's let's go over conservation of mass. Okay. And so in conservation of mass, our big um, B here will just be mass. Okay. And so our little B, which is just um, our big B over M. Since our big B here is mass, we have mass over mass, which is just one, okay? okay. Right. And so the other thing that we have to determine is, is our production term, right? And so what we said for mass was that there's no way for our mass to be created or destroyed, right? So we basically just have the, uh, you know, that's what conservation of mass is. And so for our production term, we're just gonna set that equal to zero. Okay, and so when we apply these into our uh, Reynolds transport theorem, we get the following. Okay. Okay. And so on the left-hand side, we have zero because that's our production generation term. Next, we have our accumulation term. Okay, so that's partial, partial T. 
integral of rho dv, okay? Right? Uh, so we just plug, I just plugged in little b is equal to one. Okay? And then we have our inflow outflow term which is uh, rho u dot n dA, okay. Okay. And so this is our RTT conservation of mass. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so, just some um, just some some other uh, quantities that we uh, you should know before we we actually start doing problems, right? Let's give a definition for our mass flow rate because this term often comes out when we're uh, when we're doing uh, conservation of mass. Okay. And so a mass flow rate is given the symbol m dot. And the way that we compute that is rho times a times u, okay? So it's the product of density times the cross-sectional area times the velocity, okay? And then as we, um, you know, we know probably from the pipe flow problems that we've done, this product of the area times the velocity, this is often given the symbol q, which is our, you know, our volumetric flow rate. And so, uh, you know, the, the two flow rates are different. So make sure you, you know, when you're doing these kinds of problems, you read it carefully and you need to, uh, and to see if you're dealing with a mass flow rate or a volumetric flow rate, okay? So oftentimes Q is just given the, the, uh, the name flow rate. So um, if it just says flow rate, oftentimes it means Q, which has the units of volume over time. Uh, but if it's mass flow rate, you know, the, the problem will say mass flow rate. So make sure you're kind of reading those parts of the problems uh, carefully, okay? All right. And so the other thing I, I want to go over is this guy that I've circled in orange right here. So remember this, this guy in orange right here, this is our carrying velocity. So remember this, this quantity right here represents um, the speed at which you know, uh, our quantity is being carried into our domain or out, okay? And what's special about this is that we had a, uh, a sign convention. Okay? Right, and that sign convention had to do with whether uh, we were at an inflow or an outflow. And so we said that this, uh, this quantity u dot n is greater than zero, or if it's a positive number, if we're at an outflow, right? And so that's for flow that's going out of our domain. And then this quantity u dot n is gonna be less than zero when we're at an inflow. Remember, this sign convention has to do with the fact of, um, you know, the fact that this n vector right here represents the outward unit normal. So let's say that we have a control volume like this. Our normal vector always points outward, so that's um, n right here, okay? And then when the velocity vector is aligned with n, okay, it's going this way, right? That means fluid is leaving the domain, so that's an outflow, so that's, that's why we end up with the positive number for u dot n, okay? But if the um, n is going, or the velocity is going into the domain, it's going this way, then u and n are, are facing opposite directions, which is why you get a negative quantity for u dot n, okay? All right, uh, any questions on, on this? Yeah, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, yeah, so the sign convention that we choose for, um, for this carrying velocity has to do with the directions for the vector. So, I mean, for, for your problem solving, you know, you only have to kind of remember what's in this box right here which is if you have an outflow, then you, you, you make this u dot n positive. And if you have an inflow, then you make the u dot n negative. Uh, and the reason for that is just kind of the relative directions of the, of the two of the vectors. So what I've drawn here on the right here is just a, a, a typical you know, side of a control volume uh, where you have n, which always, which always points outward from the domain. Uh, and then when u is in the same direction of n, so basically the fluid velocity is leaving, Right, then those two vectors are in the same direction. So then that quantity is positive 
but then if they're you know in opposite directions you know so the food is going into the domain then that's why u dot n is is negative thanks mm -hmm. yeah so there's a question in the chat is can i repeat again what the carrying velocity is again versus the other velocity so we're going to get to that in when we do conservation momentum and so that's the difference between carrying velocity and um and momentum velocity but um so we'll, we'll get to that basically uh, right after this yeah okay any other questions on uh, conservation of mass here okay so let's jump let's jump to uh, to that point right there so about um you know different velocities because so conservation is, of uh, mass is nice because there's only kind of one velocity in the problem to worry about, which is the carrying velocity. Okay? Uh, but later, once we get to conservation of momentum, then we have multiple velocities that we need to take into account. Okay? So let's go ahead and talk about that. Okay. Uh, and so remember, specifically, this is conservation of linear momentum. So uh, I'm not going to ask you any problems for angular momentum on the exam. So um, just worry about linear momentum. Okay. Okay. And so we're going to write out our expression for Reynolds transport here as well. Um, and so let's go ahead and define our, um, our terms. Okay. All right. So let's start with big B. And so big B right here is going to be linear momentum. And linear momentum is nothing more than just mass times velocity. So this can be mass times velocity. Okay. okay. And then our little b, which is just going to be big B divided by M, this is just going to be velocity. Okay. Right. And so the other thing we have to define here is our production term. And so our production term, the way, the way that momentum can be produced in a fluid is uh, if we apply some kind of external force. Okay. Right. And so for linear momentum problems, oftentimes I, uh, you have to, you're going to be solving for some kind of uh, anchoring force or some kind of normal force to the, to the fluid. Right. And so anytime that you have a, a fluid problem that asks for forces, you know, um, that's kind of a good hint that you should be thinking about conservation of linear momentum. Okay. All right. So let's write out the, the full expression, the RTT expression. Okay. okay. And so on the left-hand side for our production, we have the sum of all the external forces. Next, we have our accumulation term. So we have a partial partial T of U rho dv okay plus the inflow outflow term so we have integral of u uh, rho u dot n d a okay and so this uh, equation right here this is your rtt for linear momentum Okay. Okay. And so let's, let's bring it back to the question that I, I received a, a little bit earlier, which is the difference um, in the, in these two velocities. Okay. All right. So let's talk about, so, you know, most time we assume this is zero. So I'm just going to cross that out now. Okay. And the reason we do this is we assume that the flow is steady. Okay. And so let's talk about this, uh, this first circle velocity on the right, which is the U, um, U with a, a vector over it. Okay. And so the name that we give this velocity often is the uh, momentum velocity. Right. Or I think the other term that we uh, that we gave it back then was called the component velocity. And it's important at this point to kind of, uh, re let's remember kind of the properties for this momentum velocity or component, okay? And so first of all, you know, the, the important thing to know is that this is a vector, right? And so when we're applying the conservation momentum, 
you know, we, we, we always do that in either the X and Y directions. And so say like you, you, we have a problem like the, um, like the, snow, the snowblower problem on the last midterm, right? And you have an, a velocity that's coming at an angle, you're gonna have to apply you know, the linear momentum um, RTT in both the X direction and the Y direction. And then when you do that, you have to use the, the X component and the Y component of that, of that velocity, okay? Okay, and so the other property of this momentum velocity is that its sign convention follows the Cartesian sign convention. And so that means, uh, you know, if um, positive values of this um, of this component velocity are going to be either to the right for x or up for y, okay, uh, and then negative values are going to be to the left and then down, okay. And so make sure when you're choosing the sign of this component velocity, you look at which direction that it's actually facing, you know, and then you um, you know you determine if it's positive or negative based on you know your your Cartesian axes, okay. Okay. And then uh, the other velocity here is our carrying velocity, which we just we just which we just finished discussing on the last one. So the, the carrying velocity here, you know, um, it's 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 just a scalar, so it doesn't have this property of being a vector here. And then you the components that you pick for it, um, or the sign convention that you pick for it is either going to be positive if it's an outflow or negative if it's an inflow. Okay. All right. Any questions on on this? Okay. Okay. Oh, question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So the question is, can I explain the a practical difference between the two and not the mathematical difference? Yeah, I think that's that's a good idea. Okay. So I think probably the, the best thing to, to do for that is to give uh, just a very quick example. Okay? And so let's, let's do um, this problem from the notes right here. That looks like this. Okay. Right. All right, so let's say that we have a, uh, a, a fluid jet that's gonna uh, come in horizontally from the left and then leave on the right. Okay? And so actually, you know, let me draw this, uh, this control volume a little bit nicer. Okay. All right, and so the flow is going to come in here and then exit up here, right? So that means this side is going to be our inlet, and then this side up here is going to be our outlet. Okay. Okay. And so uh, for this one, you know, I'm not going to write out the full RTT, but let's uh, write out what the component and the carrying velocities are at each of these at these parts. Okay. All right, so first let's do the uh, let's do the inlet. Okay. And so if we kind of draw a, a, a diagram for the inlet right here, it looks something like this. Right? Right. And so we have fluid coming in. So let's say it has a magnitude of u, okay? And it's coming into the control volume and it's crossing it on this point right here. Okay. okay. And so let's write out what the component and the carrying velocities are. So let's write out the velocity component. So we we're going to have an x component and a y component. Okay. And then we're also going to have a carrying velocity. Okay. Okay. So let's do the x component of the of the velocity here at the inlet. And so we see that our arrow right here is just pointing horizontally to the right. Okay. And so that means we have a, a positive x component. And so the positive x component is going to be simply u, right? because that's the magnitude of the velocity here. And then since it's the velocity is just going perfectly horizontally, 
you know, then um, there's going to be no y component because there's no verticality. So then y is just going to be zero. Okay. Right. And so that's the uh, that's the components. And then now let's let's compute the carrying velocity here at the inlet. So um, and so remember the carrying velocity. We're just going to take the magnitude of the velocity and then we just assign it either a positive or a negative value depending on if it's an inlet or an outlet. Okay. And so the magnitude of the velocity here is going to be u. And then since it's an inlet, we're going to throw a negative sign on there. Okay. And so that's the, uh, um, the x and y components of the velocity at the inlet, and also the carrying velocity that you would plug into RTT. Okay. Right. And then on the next page, we're going to do the outlet, which is a little bit more complicated. Okay. All right. Any questions on this uh, so far? Oh yeah, professor. You, for these kinds of problems, we have to determine which RTT to use, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the uh, um, you know most of the times you know mass and momentum kind of go hand in hand. So for a lot of problems, you're going to have to apply uh, both. Um, you know, a lot of times you know applying conservation of mass is is usually a really good place to start um, for these uh, for these kinds of problems. So you know if you if you ever find yourself stuck, but you know it's kind of a, a it's you know it's a control volume problem. Start with conservation of mass and see if you can solve for anything from that. And then you can apply some of the later ones um, from there. Okay, and so that's the inlet. So now let's go over the outlet. So let me kind of redraw the outlet velocity up here. And so our outlet velocity is also gonna have a magnitude of u, but now it's going up at an angle of theta, okay? And so just like before, let's write out the components. And so we're going to have an x component and a y component. Okay. And then now, and then we're going to write out the carrying velocity from, from there. Okay. Okay. So let's do the components first, right? And so let's find the x component of velocity here. Right? So we know that this uh, this angle is going, uh, or this fluid is going up at an angle of theta, right? And so if we split this up into its components, it would look something like this, right? And so we have one component that goes basically horizontally um, to the right, and that's our ux. And then our vertical component is going to be uy. And so we can we can just use trigonometry here to determine you know the um, the magnitudes of these velocities. Okay? And so the x component here, ux, is simply just going to be our velocity u multiplied by cosine theta. Okay. And then our y component. Um, is, uh, is just going to be u sine theta. Okay. Right. Right. So notice that I picked positive signs for both um, u cosine theta and u sine theta, and that's because of the Cartesian sign convention. Right? And so because ux here goes from left to right, you know, that's, that's the positive x direction. And so that's why we choose a positive cosine theta for that. And for the y, uh, y component, that goes from you know, bottom to top. And so since that goes vertically upwards, we're going to choose a positive sign convention for that as well. OK. Um, OK. And so the carrying velocity here, uh, we're just going to take the magnitude of the velocity, which is u. And then we're going to put a sign in front of it uh, based on whether it's an inlet or an outlet. And so since this case, it's an outlet, we're just going to leave it as a positive u. OK. And so, um, you know, I think both of the both of the examples that we just did had the components going positive. So, you know, I, I think you know, let's quickly just see a, a case where the, one of the components is negative, right? And so, let's say that our out of our outlet velocity instead looks like this. Right? And so, it's it's pointing downwards with an angle of theta. Right? And so in this case, we have ux going positive to the right, and then uy is going um, down. Okay? And so if we write the components for this, okay? and so the x component will um, you know, still, be the, still be a positive number because it's going from left to right. So this can be u cosine theta. Okay? 
And then our y component, since, since uy is going down now, is going to be a minus u sine theta. And then our carrying velocity here, since we're since we're still at an outlet, you know, even though it's pointing down now, it's still going to be a positive u. Okay. Right. And so when you're doing these momentum problems, it, it really helps to kind of take the velocity vector from your figure, kind of draw it just as a vector by itself, break it up into components, and then that will help you determine, you know, what to put for the component and the carrying velocities. Does that make it make a bit more uh, um, bit more sense? Wait, is that bottom uh, component? Is that part of the problem, or is that just an example? Um, so the this 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 part right here, this is just a uh, this is just kind of an extra example because it's. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so for for this one, you know, we had it going vertically upwards like this, but I wanted to show you a, a case where you know you would pick a negative component and okay. what that and what that would look like. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question in the chat is, uh, should we know how to do moving control volumes with a final? That's a great question. Um, so I'll I'm, I, I'll tell you. Uh, now that there's going to be no moving control volumes for the final. Uh, so we, we did that for the midterm, so I think that's kind of enough of that. So for the final, it will be a stationary control volume. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, any uh, final questions on this? So that did take up a little bit more time than I thought. Um, so I think I, I want to move on to external flow because that one was almost, it was almost tied with, uh, with control volume. So I want to make sure we get to that. Uh, you know, uh, we, we spend a good amount of time on that today. Right? Uh, so before we move on from control lines, are there uh, any more questions? Okay. So that's uh, control volumes for you. So then now let's go over um, external flows. Okay. So this is just the most recent thing that we did uh, last week. And so the other the other name that we we give for external flows is uh, uh, flows over immersed bodies. Okay. Right. And so the general uh, the general um, you know geometry that we're going to be dealing with for external flows looks something like this. So we have some kind of you know um, arbitrary object. So you know we have just kind of this lumpy potato. And then it's sitting in this kind of broad flow field. Right? So it's going to be looking like this. Right? And so the fluid velocity is going to be hitting our object like this. Right? And so oftentimes we characterize the upstream velocity uh, with a symbol u infinity. Okay? And then what's going to happen is that the uh, once the fluid hits your object, it's going to have to adjust to it and, and move around it. Okay? okay. Because it's you know because since your object is solid, there's no way for the fluid to pass through it, and so it has to adjust. And because of the uh, the adjustment that that the fluid ha that the fluid has to do, it often produces forces on this on this object. Okay, and so we had two two kind of broad categories of forces that we uh, that we looked at. So the first force was the drag force, okay. and so the the drag force here is a force that's in the uh, in the same direction as the flow. Okay, right, 
And so since our flow here is going from left to right, the drag force will also go from left to right. And so any, any force that gets produced that goes from left to right on the object, we characterize that as the drag force. And so the other force that we, uh, that we talked about was the lift force. Okay. Okay. And so the lift force is, is going to be any force that goes perpendicular to the, to the flow. Okay. Okay. And so it can go this way um, or it can go this way, right? depending, depending on the properties of the, of the flow. Okay. And so the important thing with the lift force is that it's, it's always perpendicular to the flow direction. Okay? And actually, technically, if this were a three-dimensional object, the, the lift force could also come out of the page and it can also go into the page. So the lift force can basically, you know, there's, there's a lot of options for, you know, which direction the lift force goes. Um, and that depends on whether you're applying spin on the object or, you know, the geometry of the object and the flow. But the important thing is the lift force is always perpendicular to the flow direction. Okay. okay. Um, and so, you know, in terms of calculations, you know, uh, the way that we're going to compute these forces is with, you know, the respective coefficients. Okay. Okay. So before we get that, get there, are there any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. So let's go over how we actually compute these, uh, these lift and drag forces. Okay. Okay, um, and so I'm going to give them the symbol FD for drag force, okay? And then I'll give them lift force the symbol FL, okay? And so the formulas for these guys are, are almost the same. Um, it's just the, uh, the coefficient here is going to be different. So to compute the, uh, um, the lift force, or, or the drag force, sorry, let's start with that one. So the drag force is going to be, um, we have this coefficient CD where CD here is our drag coefficient, right? Oh, question. So when I, when I drew the potato, was it moving to the left, causing the drag to the right? Yeah, so that's, that's a good point, actually. So, you know, the, the way that we can get a flow field like this is if, you know, our potato here, if our potato was actually moving to, through the flow, so, you know, that's kind of like our baseball, like we threw it through the air. And so in that case, you know, the, uh, the object would be moving to the left, and then relative to the object, you know, the air is going to be rushing past it or any fluid is going to be rushing past it. Okay. And so that's one way to produce this, uh, um, this kind of flow field is if your object is actually moving through the air. Okay. And then the flow is going to be moving past it in the opposite direction. Okay. And so the other way we can produce this flow field is that if we have a stationary object and we, and we flow fluid past it. Right? So think of like a rock that's sitting in a river. Right? So the rock is just kind of stationary, but the river is flowing past it. And so that's, that's two different ways that you can produce this, this kind of flow field. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and so the drag force uh, is gonna be the product of CD, where the CD right here is our drag coefficient. Okay. And then we're gonna multiply that by one half times rho times u squared times a, okay? And then our formula for the lift force is, is very similar, except instead of a drag coefficient, we're gonna have a lift coefficient. Okay, and same thing, we're just gonna multiply this by one half rho u squared times a, okay? And so the important thing to note for, for these formulas is, you know, the most important thing is, is our lift and drag coefficients. Okay. Okay. And so the way that you determine the CD and CL is that uh, usually, you know, you can, look, you can look these up in some kind of table. Okay. 
because the thing, because remember the thing with the external flows is that the, the flow field of going around an object is actually, you know, really, really complicated. And it's, it's hard, you know, with even, even with uh, computer software to really characterize that, uh, that flow field. And so in order to do practical calculations, you know, the way that we, we do this is we sum up kind of the effects of geometry into these coefficients. Okay. And so, and so since every geometry is, is going to be different to some degree, you know, it's, it's hard to really do this. For, uh, it's hard to really do practical calculations on that. So oftentimes what's done is that experiments are, are done on these kinds of objects and they sum up the effects into these lift coefficients and their drag coefficients. Mm -hmm. All right. So the question in the chat is the area in this equation depends on the shape of the frontal or the surface area, correct? Yeah, that's a good question. So that was um, that was definitely the next point right here. Right? So these A's right here, you know, what you pick for that and how you compute that, it really depends on the type of object that you're doing, whether it's blunt or it's streamlined, and uh, what kind of a, uh, um, you know, whether you're doing lift or drag. Okay? And so for this area right here, you know, for now I'll say that you know this is really a a case by case basis. And I'll, I'll kind of go over some rules on how you choose that area on, on the next page. Okay. Okay. Because that that's probably the most important thing here. Because a lot of times, you know, your lift and drag coefficients, you can look that up in the table. You know, the density is the density. You know, that's 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 usually um, pretty straightforward. Um, the velocity here. Remember, this velocity is our u infinity. And so that's just the speed of kind of the free stream or the upstream velocity. Right? And so probably the most difficult thing here and, and the thing that trips people up is choosing the correct area to use with these um, with these expressions. Right? And we'll go over that on the on the next page. Right? And so before we get there, are there uh, any questions on on this? Yeah, so the question in the chat is, will, 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 uh, will I tell you guys which table of reference or figure to reference for these coefficients? So um, it'll go even beyond that. So be, just, just to make sure that there's uniformity in the, uh, in the exam answers, um, I will either give you the lift coefficients and the drag coefficients that I want you to use, um, or um, you might have to solve for it. So there might be cases where I, I give you a problem and I give you basically everything else. You know, I say that the drag force is this, um, or you can compute the drag force some way. Um, and then I want you to solve for the lift and drag coefficient. So there's, um, there's going to be no, the only, the only outside reference that I, I need you guys to do for the exam is going to be the Moody chart for the, for the friction factors. Um, but if you have your MATLAB scripts or your websites, that's, that's fine too. But for lift and drag coefficients, I would either give that to you or ask you to solve for it explicitly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the, uh, the areas here. Because for this areas, you know, we, we actually have, you know, several different options on how we, we can pick that, right? Uh, because we have a three-dimensional object and there's lots of different ways you can, you can slice the areas. Right? And so the first um, type of area, uh, which is kind of the most, um, you know, kind of probably what, what most people think about when they think about area for a three-dimensional object is the surface area. And so that's literally just, you know, the, the amount of area that covers the outside of, of an object. And so the situations where you would choose the surface area would be the, would be for the drag on a streamlined object. And so remember, you know, when we when we were going over this, we talked about the differences between a streamline and a blunt object. Okay, and so a streamline object, those are um, those are objects that are kind of um, designed to kind of uh, to fit the flow uh, really well. Okay, okay. 
And so kind of the, the general, uh, you know, the most generic streamlined object that most people draw is just an airfoil. So that's kind of a, a great example. But other examples that, uh, that you might be familiar with are like sports cars, right? So, um, so if you look like a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, you know, they have this kind of very nice, um, you know, very slender kind of, you know, smooth curves kind of design. And so if you actually look at the, uh, the velocity streamlines going over a streamline object, you know, then they, they, you can see that they, they hug the object really, really well, right? Okay. And remember what's significant about the streamline object is that once the flow kind of goes um, over the tail end, um, we have a very small leak. And so because uh, the wake is really small, um, you know, we're not going to have that much pressure drag, right? And so most of the drag on, on a streamlined object is actually going to come from uh, viscous friction. Okay. And so remember, viscous friction is, is a force um, that goes parallel to the surface. And the reason it exists is because the, the fluid is, is really kind of rubbing itself onto the, uh, um, onto the surface. Right? And so visually, it looks something like this. Right? And so we have little force vectors that uh, kind of go along the surface just like that. And so the total amount of drag force here, you can see, is going to be proportional to the surface area of the object. Okay. Because basically, the more surface area that you have, the more um, the more area that the friction force can actually, you know, um, apply onto the onto your object, right? And so intuitively, if you think of this as like if you have kind of a small two small pieces of paper and you rub them against each other, you know, that's only going to produce so much friction force. But if you have two really big pieces of paper and you rub them together, that's going to produce more overall force, just because there's more surface area for the two to be contacted. And so that's why, you know, if you have a streamlined object and you're interested in computing the drag, um, you're often going to use this, uh, just the total surface area of the object. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. Okay. So that's the, uh, so that's the first type of area that you can use. And so the next type of area, which is kind of the kind of the opposite um, situation that we went over, is the frontal area. Okay. And so the frontal area, you can define this as basically like the the, the projected two D um, area um, that the flow would would see. And so what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if, if we kind of, um, you know, say that you're kind of riding along with the flow and then you have the object that's kind of in front of you like this, basically that 2D image that you see of the, of the object is, uh, is what you're going to, to see. Okay? Um, so I, I don't know if this is an old meme or not, but I think it's, it's kind of relevant here. Uh, but uh, for those of you who watch, um, you know, old school Pokemon, there was one episode where they kind of did like a, who's that Pokemon? And they did kind of a, a black circle like this, right? And they asked, you know, or, or they asked, you know, what, what is this thing? So I think most people said it was, it was a Pokeball because it's, it's, it's an object, right? And so that's, that's, kind of what I, what, that's kind of what I mean by, you know, that's the projected area. So even though you have a spherical object, if you project it onto a, uh, 
onto a 2D plane, it looks like a circle, right? Yeah, so the, uh, so, uh, you know, in the chat, someone already completed a meme. So actually what this, uh, what this object was, was a Jigglypuff viewed from above. So, you know, that's, uh, so that kind of illustrates this, this kind of thing where like, even though you have a three dimensional object, you can project, it has a projected shape in the 2D, um, in, in the 2D plane. Okay. And so when do we, when do we want to use frontal areas uh, in terms of drag? And so in terms of drag, um, you know, we want to um, use this for blunt objects. Okay. So let me draw our blunt object here. So let's say that we have a sphere. And so, you know, what we know about blunt objects is that because they're so blunt, what's going to happen is that the boundary layer is going to separate as it goes over the object, right? And so if we have the flow that's coming in like this, right, it's going to go over the top, it's over the bottom, right? Eventually, you know, because this object is so blunt, you know, the, the boundary layer is just going to separate and you're going to have something like this, right? And so, you know, in this region on the back of the, of the, of the object, we have what's known as a wake. Okay. And so visually, you know, that's, that's kind of the wake that you see, you know, if you, if you ever watched like a motorboat kind of um, drive on, on like, on like a lakefront, you know, you see kind of the, the region behind the boat. That's, that's the wake basically. Okay. And so what we know about the wake is that the pressures here are, are very low. If we contrast that to the to the conditions on the other side of the object, where right here we basically have a stagnation point, okay. Uh, the stagnation point, we know that we're going to have a high pressure, right? Okay. And so, since we have this difference in pressure here, we have high pressure upstream. and then low pressure downstream. Okay. And so since we have this difference in pressure, you know, we're going to have a net force that goes this way. Okay. And if you remember the name that we gave for this, you know, uh, a, a force, you know, due to the pressure differences upstream and downstream, we call this uh, form drag. And so since the, since the source of the force, uh, since, since the source of form drag here is just going to be a, uh, you know, a difference in pressure, you know, uh, remember the way that we obtain um, a force from pressure is that we have to multiply by an area, right? And so since, you know, we have a pressure force like this, basically, then the way that we, we obtain the, uh, the force from this pressure difference is going to be that frontal area. Okay. And so the form drag there is, is produced, um, you know, um, just because the, we have an upstream pressure and a downstream pressure um, and that acts on kind of a, on a kind of a projected frontal area. So, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with blunt objects, you know, the, the area that you plug into your, um, to your, you know, drag force equation is going to be your, your frontal area. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. And so the one, um, I, one other area that we, we talked about briefly in terms of lift is the plan form area. Okay. 
And so this is this is something that's specific to kind of winged objects, because plant form is, is something that's uh, that you compute for for wings. Okay. And so if you if you uh, if you don't have a winged object, you know another um, the probably the most common area that you use for from lift is going to be the surface area. Okay. But if you if you have a, a, a situation where you actually have a wing then you can compute the plan form area. Okay. And so the plan form area specifically here is going to be the product. of two quantities. So the, uh, the first quantity here is going to be the chord length. Okay. Right. And so the chord length here, this is the, um, the distance between the leading edge and the trailing edge. Okay. And then the other uh, um, quantity here that we multiply by is the length of the wing. Okay. And the wing length is simply just, you know, how long that you, do you extend your wing out? And so it's, you can almost think of it as kind of like a simplified version of, of surface area, right? And so just an example, let's, let's draw a bird. Okay. I'm just gonna draw one side of the bird, okay? It has a ginormous wing, right? Here's a beak to let you know that it's a bird, okay? And so the, uh, um, the chord length here will be this distance. And so you can see that's the distance from the leading edge. So the leading edge is this top edge right here, and the trailing edge is the bottom one, right? And then the wing length is gonna be this, this distance right here. Okay, and so that's just specifically, you know, how long the wing is, okay? Right? And so this is specifically for, uh, for winged objects that are in lift, right? Uh, but if you have kind of a more general situation for lift, most of the time you're going to use the uh, just the surface area for it okay um, but if you have this specific, if you have a wing you know a lot of the lift coefficients and a lot of the experiments that were done for winged objects um, they use this for the area just to kind of make it as, as general as, as possible okay okay uh, any questions on on this okay so one more thing that I wanted to, uh, uh, to cover um, with respect to, um, you know, lift and drag is this uh, concept of stall. So I think, I think we briefly kind of went over it last time, um, but, you know, I think it's, it's kind of worth uh, talking about again. Okay. Okay. And so stall, um, you know, this is uh, something that happens when you have kind of a, a catastrophic drop in lift for a winged flying object. Okay. And so stall happens when your angle of attack um, gets too large.
Okay. Uh, because when, when you have a winged flying object, you know, um, a lot of times we have something that looks like this, right? right? So there's kind of the cross section of your wing right here, right? Oftentimes what pilots can do is that they can, they can alter the lift properties of their, um, of their aircraft by kind of literally tilting the, uh, the aircraft up. Yeah, yeah. So their their comment in the chat uh, in, reminds me of Spider Man when the vulture extends its angles to slow him down. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly you know um, that's a that's a great example of that. And so uh, what what the comment was referring to was that you know in in Spider Man you know the vulture kind of comes in you know and, and he's winged you know and he basically can tilt himself up and down and then from there he can alter the amount of lift that he generates and the amount of drag that's generated as well. So he can do that to basically control whether he slows down or, or not. And so for, for any kind of flying object, you know, we, we define this angle of attack to be basically how much the wing is being tilted, tilted up like this, okay? Uh, and so we call that angle um, alpha, okay? Okay. And so generally, you know, as you kind of raise alpha or as you tilt yourself back some more, uh, you're gonna increase the drag on your, uh, on your, uh, on your object. Um, you know, so that's, you know, that's uh, slowing yourself down. Um, but you can also increase your lift as well, because what's, what you're doing here as you're increasing the angle of attack is you're making the flow across your wing to be more asymmetric. Because remember, in order to, to, uh, to successfully generate lift, you need to have kind of an, uh, an, an, an asymmetric flow field. So you need to have um, the flow over the top of your object needs to look different than the flow on the bottom. Um, and, that's, and that asymmetry is what generates your lift. Okay? And so with stall, what happens is that if you increase your angle of attack too much, then your boundary layer is going to separate from your wing. And so if you, if you kind of make your, your wing, you know, um, angled a little bit too high, then you effectively turn your, uh, uh, turn your wing into a blunt object. Okay. And we know that for blunt objects, you know, we, we generate this, uh, this very big wake region behind. And the, and the creation of this giant wake region will make, you know, the form drag really high. And once the form drag gets really high, then you slow down, then that, you know, that destroys your lift and then you just kind of fall, fall out of the air, right? Okay, uh, any questions on, uh, on any of this? Okay, so we have a little bit less than seven minutes. Um, so I do wanna cover fluid stacks just a, a tiny bit. At least for the at least the most relevant things that uh, that you need to know. Right? And so, if you notice from the study guide, you know when I list fluid statics, I didn't mention um, buoyancy on there. Right? So, uh, so you won't have to worry about buoyancy for the final exam. Right? And so, the thing I want you to focus on for in terms of fluid statics is going to be um, manometry and also on the forces on on surfaces. Because uh, buoyancy is, is kind of something that you can just, you can do in a class kind of just once. And so we, we did it on the first midterm. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of done with, uh, with buoyancy at this point. Okay. Okay. And so the driving factor in fluid statics is, is, is to remember that the uh, pressure increases with depth in a static fluid.
Okay. And so if we have a tank that looks like this, right? And we have our water. Okay. You know, as we go down or as we as we go lower into the tank, then the pressure is going to increase. And remember, the reason we have the pressure increase is that as we get lower and lower in the fluid, you know, we have more fluid above us that we have to uh, that we have to support. Okay. And so to support that weight, you know, the pressure has to has to increase. Okay. And so kind of the, the key formula that we uh, that we use for this is that we basically says say that you know if we call you know this location one and we call this location two down here, okay, then we basically says that the pressure at location two minus the pressure at location one is going to be equal to minus gamma times their relative heights. I'll call this H's. So we'll call this H um, two minus H one. Okay. Okay. And so remember this gamma right here. This gamma right here is our specific weight. Okay. And so specific weight is nothing more than just the product of the fluid density and gravity. And so if you have a difference in height in a fluid, then there's going to be a difference in pressure because of the uh, um, because of gravity. Okay. So the, there's a question in the chat is uh, it says uh, our zero level is the top of the tank. Uh, and so yes, so usually, you know, the, the convention that we use for these problems is that, you know, if we if you choose a location at the top of the tank, which is exposed to atmosphere. Just for uh, convenience, uh, we, we assume that the pressure is going to be zero up here. Okay. Yeah, good, uh, good point. All right, are there uh, any other uh, questions on, on this? Okay. Okay, so we have one minute left, and so uh, I do, I do want to briefly go over uh, hydrostatic forces on surfaces, um, but maybe we'll just uh, give you the SparkNotes version of it. Okay. Okay, and so when we're talking about hydrostatic forces on surfaces, remember we're we're always uh, mostly concerned with two main things. Okay. And so the first thing is the magnitude of the force. Okay. And so that's just uh, basically a statement of, of how much force is being applied onto your object. Okay. And we also are concerned with the location. And so the magnitude of the force, remember the way that we compute this is we use the depth of the centroid. So that was kind of the key quantity there that uh, that you need to find that you need to to use, and so once you know the depth of the centroid, you can plug that in to solve for the uh, the magnitude of the uh, um, of the force. Okay, 
And the location, you know, uh, what I want you guys to re always remember is that the, the, the depth of the um, location is always going to be slightly below the centroid. Okay, and the reason for that is because the pressure forces are always going to increase with respect to depth, right? And so since our pressure forces are increasing, right, then the, uh, then the lower parts of your surface are gonna experience more pressure force than the higher ones, okay? Uh, and so when you're doing these kinds of problems, I want you to kind of use these two principles to kind of check your work to say like, you know, am I using the centroid for the magnitude? And then when I compute the location, is that actually below the centroid? Uh, and that's, those are kind of two things that you can do to kind of, uh, to kind of check your, your work. Okay. Okay. Any final questions on uh, on this stuff here? Okay. Uh, so that's all we got time for today. Uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in. And you know, I, I want to take a moment to say, you know, thank you everyone for being a, a great class. And so I know this was a, a very strange semester. You know, um, I think the only two people I know who they look like are Stephen and Chris because they they turn on their webcams. <laughs> And so it's, 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 you know, from my perspective, it, it's a little bit strange just to see you guys as, uh, as mostly just names on a list. But, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed teaching this class. You know, I really enjoyed, you know, interacting with all of you guys. So, so thank you for being a great class. Um, and I'll see you guys next week for the, uh, for the final. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Dr. Tran. We'll see you later. Yep. I'll see you guys. Uh, see you guys when I see you. Yeah. Sounds good. Take it easy. You too. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>